Anyway, um, interestingly, I, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, and I'm not 100% sure of this, but I think I was told this by our risk manager, and this is really unfortunate. It shows you that the law is not fair and, and, and isn't even um, the same all over the country. In New York State, apology is an admission of guilt. And we've been told don't apologize, which I really don't like because sometimes you want to apologize, but in New York State, in fact, it's admissible and is generally viewed as an admission of negligence, which is wrong, but it's the law. And again, that's another shocking fact that sometimes the law isn't perfect. So what I'm going to do over the next 30 minutes or so is talk um, about cases that I've consulted on, um, somewhat by accident, and now because I get called all the time, I have actually reviewed quite a few um, negligence cases. So this is the, the things I'll talk about will have started well after um, what we heard about in the last talk. These are going to be cases that are either already lawsuits, or a plaintiff's attorney is strongly considering bringing a lawsuit, or a defense attorney thinks there's going to be a lawsuit and wants to talk to me about what they're going to do. Is it defensible? Is it not? Is it a good case? Is it not? What really happens sometimes? So um, I do have a disclosure I mentioned before. I consult for a medical company. I'm not sure this is a conflict of interest, but obviously I'm going to be talking about consulting for various uh, defense and plaintiff's attorneys. I didn't list all of them. Um, these are the objectives. You have those in your handout. Uh, just as a sidelight, I love this slide. If you find yourself traveling between the city of Nice, France, and Monaco, which is a very nice place to find yourself, actually, um, and you're interested in obstetric anesthesia or obstetrics, you might want to stop at the Volti Museum. We just happened to find it by accident as we were along that road, along the Mediterranean. Um, Volti is, a, I guess, an artist who does n essentially nothing in this museum but bronze statues, and essentially every single one of them is of a pregnant woman. I don't know if I want to meet this guy, but that's what he does, and that's the outside of the museum. And I suspect these are actually labor positions, but in fact, he does know how to position patients for regional anesthesia. <laughs> so uh, this is a cu couple of basic slides, because um, I do find that some of the people I talk to, I guess mostly my residents, but still some people I talk to don't fully understand some of the structural nature of the process. And our lawyer will correct me if I get any of this wrong, but this is pretty basic stuff here. Um, in order to at least theoretically, in order to prove or to, to get a finding of medical malpractice in a court of law, one needs to have uh, uh, shown that the, the plaintiff needs to show that there's been a doctor-patient relationship, that the doctor has some responsibility to the patient, uh, that there's been an injury or a loss of some sort, that there was a breach of the standard of care, and we'll get to that. That's going to be most of what we'll talk about for the rest of the time, that is the, the, the doctor or the nurse anesthetist uh, did something wrong, in effect. Um, and that that breach led to or contributed significantly to the injury. And that's sometimes an issue. So who decides whether something that the doctor or other practitioner did is a breach of the standard of care? Well, unfortunately, at least when I'm involved, it's often someone like myself who tries to convince a jury or uh, sometimes even before the case goes to court, tries to explain to the lawyer whether or not this seems to be a breach. And what does a breach mean? Well. Again, you've probably seen some of this, but in different states have different language. But basically, the question is, did the practitioner perform in a reasonable, like a reasonable and prudent practitioner would do? Or did he do or she do what a majority of physicians would do? Or did he or she do what a respectable minority of physicians would do? Or did he or she follow or reasonably follow guidelines and standards? Um, I think you can see there's no absolute here. It is a matter of opinion, and it is argued between experts. And there have been certainly cases where I, I have been on the opposite side of experts whom I do respect. So it's often a little bit difficult to know for sure where, um, if you will, where the truth is. Most of the time, and this is just how all of us do, most of the time I think I'm right and I think the other expert is wrong. <laughs> Um, remember that these are civil cases. If you get sued, you're not being charged with a crime. It's, it's actually pretty important to remember that sometimes. Um, and civil cases have all kinds of reasons for being settled and going one way or another. And if there's maybe the top statement I make to people involved in these, and occasionally I do end up talking to the defendants when I'm defending them, uh, this is not about guilt. It's only about liability. It's not even always about truth. And to some extent, you have to understand that and and do what's right and live your life. 
Um, generally, in most states, and I may be corrected on this, it's a six-juror trial, and in most states, you need a five-to-one verdict. So you don't need beyond a reasonable doubt. You, know, you don't need unanimity among the, in the jury. And the question of causation, or the question of was it my fault or your fault, typically comes down to something like the 50.00001% question. That is, is it more probable than not that the anesthesiologist's actions caused this or contributed to this? That's the question the expert is asked. It's not, are you sure this caused it? Now, my answer may be, I'm almost sure, or I'm, I'm as positive as I can be, but sometimes it is, yeah, it seems quite probable that the disease we're looking at was preeclampsia, and it, and it seems quite probable that the actions of the anesthesiologist made things worse. I mean, that would be a kind of statement, or, or didn't make things worse. Um, and then finally on the probability, is this the most probable cause of the injury? You know, did the failure to dose the epidural cause the injury or did, the, did the, the dosing of the epidural cause the respiratory arrest or whatever? Um, the, the next most common question I get asked by my residents is how do you get into this business because it sounds pretty interesting and it pays fairly well. Um, and basically I, I fell into it. I, I got a couple of cases referred to me by colleagues. Then my own malpractice insurance company had a couple of OB anesthesia cases, and because I had this nice, this nice title at Columbia, not, not the APGAR title, but just being director of the division, um, they asked me to look at them. And from that, other defense attorneys called me, and about five years later, a plaintiff's attorney called me, and, and it just it, they basically just come. I don't advertise. I don't... Uh, um, some, some do, but I don't do any of the advertising. People just you know, look for senior obstetric anesthesiologists on the internet, apparently, because I do get calls from, from attorneys who just found my name by searching you know, Columbia University obstetrics. Um, now, the malpractice area is not all bad news. And in fact, for anesthesia practitioners, it's not really that bad at all. So again, another point I'll make is just calm down. This is what's happened to malpractice premiums in the last uh, about 30 years in real dollars. They've gone down by about half, maybe a little less than half, but you know, 60, 70%. So that's good, and that reflects, as you probably can figure out, there's actually fewer injuries or at least less monetary damage being caused by us. That is not only good financially, it's just good. Um, there's more good news. This is all kinds of malpractice payments, not just um, anesthesiology. And you can see that after a peak here, I'm not sure what the y-axis is, but after a peak here in the early 2000s, it's been actually going down. I'm not 100% sure why. Maybe some tort reform, maybe some better, better practice in medicine. But for those of us in New York and California, payouts from five states represented about half of all the payouts in 2012. So it's still financially interesting to practice in New York, Pennsylvania, California, New Jersey, or Florida. Now, plaintiff's lawyers, not our favorite people, but they actually love anesthesiologists and they have tremendous respect for us. They think we are absolutely the best doctors in the world, of course, until you're sued. Um, I, I thought in this audience you would like the two following excerpts. This is from, I know you all read the Journal of Legal Medicine. Um, I certainly read it. Um, actually, I don't, but um, if you read this, it says, basically, the first paragraph just says that the American Society of Anesthesiologists is, the, um, is our professional organization, and basically, it's an attack on ACOG. I think you'll, you may or may not like this, but specific, reading this specifically, ACOG has not risen above the kind of wishful thinking that has led to the opportunistic conclusion that nothing bad happens on its members' watch. For more than three decades, ACOG has promoted a false response to medical liability cases, disconnecting obstetricians from the kind of proactive, ethically motivated mandates that are needed. Basically, they're saying that obstetricians don't take any responsibility and change the, this had to do with changing the um, fetal heart rate guidelines. Um, but we are wonderful because we understood there was a crisis of terrible things happening to some of our patients and we put in, and this is to some extent true in anesthesiology, monitoring guidelines, monitoring standards, uh, better education and good practice. So we're the good guys. Uh, so just next time you're sued, bring this up and say, but I'm an anesthesiologist or nurse anesthetist and we fixed everything, so leave me alone. It, it won't work. Okay. So what have I seen in the period of time that 12, 15 years when I've been getting quite a few of these cases to review. Just to give you a sense of what's, what I think is really out there. Now, this is just one person. This is not uh, an academic survey of every case in the world. 
I was actually a little bit shocked last night, I updated this slide, to look at my email inbox and my files in my email, and there are 63 different law firms I've seen cases from. Uh, I was actually surprised by this. Um, a lot, some of these, I get a lot of cases. The New York defense firms typically will call me for most obstetric anesthesia cases, so I have 10 or 12 or 15 cases for some of those big firms. For most of these firms, I have one or two. I've reviewed about 170 cases in the last 13 years. That's an estimate because I didn't keep, I don't keep perfect records of this, certainly not eight or 10 years ago, I didn't. Approximately, well, I guess this is about 60% have been for the defense and about 40% uh, for the plaintiff. Uh, the last couple of years has been about 50-50. So I get a lot of calls from plaintiff's attorneys. I'm not sure that makes me very popular here. Um, however, I've actually, only, this is where I'm really not an expert at all. I've only given 15 depositions. This is partly because in the state of New York, experts don't give depositions before trial. And I've only been to trial five times. I mean, testified at trial five times. I've never been to trial as defendant yet. Um, just to give you a sense of what's in the literature, so I can tell you roughly about 170 cases. Um, the closed claims analysis uh, published a few years ago for obstetric cases had 686 cases, 190 in the last 25 years and 496 more than 25 years ago, let's say. So in fact, uh, to some extent, the cases on my computer are at least comparable to the cases, uh, the number of cases here. Uh, at least not not this, the same order of magnitude anyway. Um, now, what kind of cases do I actually see? I decided to pick plaintiff's cases because those are the ones that would probably bother you more. Um, to some extent, it's the same things I see on the defense side. Um, so of, 40, of the 40 last cases where I have pretty good records, about 20% are, it's a terrible phrase, I know, but this is what the lawyers will say in their first conversation, it's a bad baby case, you know, a, a serious birth injury. Um, a, co a few have been neural injuries from supposedly from anesthesia, epidural anesthesia usually. Um, several cardiac arrests, high spinals at C-section. I'm going to talk about a few of those cases. Several hemorrhages, some of which have been uh, pretty hard to figure out if anyone did anything wrong. So my general tendency is to think someone didn't. And I've actually talked to a couple of plaintiff's attorneys out of a lawsuit by saying, I just don't see how you're going to prove anyone did anything wrong because I think when you review a first case that's just a hemorrhage at C-section or at any other operation, there's a lot of blood and a lot of transfusion. The patient doesn't make it. Um, it's sometimes very hard to tell, but at least a few that were obviously negligent. And I'll show you at least one of those, I think. Um, the usual anesthesia delay claim at C-section comes up not infrequently. And then there are a couple of interesting catheter technical issues um, and uh, a couple of posterior puncture headache issues. And I'll, I'll just, I don't think I have those in these slides, but I'll reiterate what, what Ed Riley said yesterday. The two cases I've seen that were posterior puncture headaches, the key issue was that the anesthesiologist poo-pooed the problem. It was a, what did I say, benign, self-limited, slightly annoying headache. Um, uh, both of them led to um, basically a patient being ignored for about five to eight days, a subarachnoid hemorrhage, one death, one that recovered, but um, the main issue was a complete lack of any significant notes on the chart or evidence of any contact with the patient, so that I really thought this was terrible care. You might argue with me, but it looked bad the outcome being bad obviously makes things look worse, but the truth is it was not, it did not meet what I would consider to be a minimal standard of care, which was at least to tell the patient that, you know, this was a serious issue. What kind of things don't I see that everyone talks about that they think they're worried about? I have to tell you, I have not seen any case where the issue of getting informed consent has been an issue. This is not to say you shouldn't get informed consent, and I do understand the, the statement that having an informed consent discussion may help you later when one of the things you talked about does happen. Obviously, that makes the disclosure or the explanation much easier. But I've never seen a case where it actually was a serious issue that uh, the uh, CRNA or anesthesiologist hadn't gotten informed consent. Uh, there was one case at trial uh, which involved an injury from an epidural. I was on the plaintiff's side where the plaintiff, we, my, my side, if you will, but I was the expert, I wasn't really an advocate, um, tried to claim that the anesthesiologist had not gotten informed consent for performing an epidural, and the judge actually said something like, wait a minute, an epidural, that's that thing where the woman sits on the side of the bed and the anesthesiologist and put that needle in her back, says, just move on, that's implied consent. He just didn't want to hear it. I mean, I, I don't know the exact wording, and I, perhaps I'm getting the law wrong, but he basically said, stop it, that's silly, let's move on. Um, I generally don't see cases involving sick, complex patients because 
Sick, complex patients, complications are sort of expected. Frankly, they're relatively easier to defend when they happen because there's usually an explanation, whether the explanation is right or wrong. Um, um, I, I, this, I should change this slide. I've now reviewed one case of epidural hematoma, and the one case I was sued on was an epidural hematoma. Um, pain during C-section was at one point the most common cause of lawsuits in the United Kingdom. I have not seen any, well now I have seen one case where that's an allegation, but it actually involved the anesthesiologist simply not being present in the hospital. So it's a slightly different kind of case. It's not inadequate anesthesia, it's non-existent anesthesiologist. Um, and the drug error, actually I have not seen a case that came down to drug error, certainly could. So. We'll talk about a few cases. Again, I, this is by its nature short, maybe not short enough, depending whether you enjoy this, but here we go. Here's a case I was called on, a defense case. I got a phone call from, uh, I'm not gonna tell the cities or certainly try not to, get, I hope there are no names in here. It wasn't from New York though, it was from, from outside New York, and I got a phone call. An anesthesiologist was being sued for a, it was a bad baby case, you know, some kind of birth injury. I don't know the nature of it. It doesn't particularly matter for my analysis of the anesthesiologist's performance. The obstetricians basically wanted to do a really stat C-section, and the anesthesiologist wanted to wait 10 minutes to fluid load to do the spinal. The medical stuff we could talk about some other time. We all know now or should that fluids don't really matter at C-section, and if you just give a little phenylephrine, you can, get a, you can, you can either give you know, 50 mics of phenylephrine or 9 liters of fluid. So that's not really the issue here. Uh, so when I first look at it, I say, well, that's not so great. I mean, if it's really a stat section, waiting 10 minutes is... You know, either you do general anesthetic if you think you can't do a spinal, or certainly we even know if you want to do a spinal, you shouldn't even wait 10 minutes. So that's a little problematic. But of course, you should look at the case. You have to look at the case. And I did. So he sent me the case. And here's what you see. You see a 28-year-old G3P2 whose last birth was by C-section. She really wants a vaginal delivery. I know you've never seen any of these patients. Um, she's having an augmented labor. She's in labor. They're giving some oxytocin. And she's doing OK. This is about 10 years ago. And uh, there's some bleeding. Not terrible bleeding, but you know, there's bleeding, they're a little worried. And the fetal heart rate goes down, but then comes back up to the 130s, and they do suggest a C-section. It's quite well documented, or you know, well, documented well enough. And um, heart rate comes back, so they'll let her labor a little more, hope for the best. She's maybe seven, eight centimeters dilated. She's got a shot. But then the heart rate goes down, goes back to 130 again. But it was a pretty significant d decrease. The nurse notes at 1715 that she called anesthesia for, for the C-section. Uh, anesthesia is there at 1728. At 1734, they're in the operating room. For 10 minutes, he gives a liter of ringers. That's on the chart. The time is pretty obvious. So, you know, you could say, hmm, this may be problematic, right? It really may be, given the story you've been told. Spinal goes in in a minute and a half, something like that. That's, uh, what time was that, 47? So there were no issues with what he did. He gave the right drug, he used the right needle, he, you know, he, he didn't do anything particularly stupid. So spinal's in 1747, time of incision is 12 minutes later. That's from the anesthesia record. This is why, to be frank, this is why the lawyer needs an anesthesiologist to look at the record. I think most of you are starting to think a little bit different than you did a couple of minutes ago. Time of delivery is 11 minutes after that. So. Again, I'm doing, I'm, this is not going to be a quiz. I'm going to go through what I thought. You could disagree, talk to me later, hit me, come up from behind, whatever. But my opinion, and probably yours, is at the time of the C-section, in fact, there was no sense of urgency. That's how you would explain all these 10 minutes, 8 minutes, another 10 minutes, 11 minutes, another 12 minutes. In fact, and, and based on the fetal heart rate when they went in, there was no sense that this baby was in big trouble. Once the baby was born with a, you know, a pH of, I don't know, 6.92 or something, then all of a sudden the obstetrician said, we were saying stat, we were saying stat, and the damn anesthesiologist wouldn't move along. I explained this to the defense attorney who said, yeah, I suspected it sounded a little like that. He says, I'm going to go back to the sort of meeting with everyone and tell them that's what you think, and the anesthesiologist dropped from the case. I mean, it's not a great victory. The baby's still harmed. Some of the obstetricians probably got sued. But this is the sort of thing you do as an expert when you look at a case. The fact is it's fun to look at, I mean, especially when it wasn't you that did it. You get to sort of, <laughs> you get to sort of evaluate what the real events were. Let's talk about another delay case, though. Again, this is a common 
you know these are common, if you will, charges. I mean, charge isn't quite the right word, but you know what I'm saying. You're told, you know, anesthesia delayed, and therefore the, the, the baby's hurt, or occasionally even the mom is hurt. A C-section was called for a very bad tracing. No question, this was a terrible fetal heart rate tracing. 1021. The nurse noted the bradycardia first um, 12 minutes earlier, called the obstetrician. The obstetrician came, and the 1021 said, we need to do a C-section. It's not clear when the anesthesiologist was called. And this is going to be true at all your places. It's hard to say when you were called. You may or may not have a paging system that can be interrogated. You may use personal cell phones, and you probably could. We've, I've seen some cases where we've gone to the Verizon and ATT records. Um, the anesthesiologist arrives uh, 40, what is that, about 45 minutes after the uh, note that the OB wrote. That's a long time. He spends nine minutes with the patient in her labor room getting consent before going to the OR. Field heart rate during all this time is never above 80. A baby's delivered, you know, not good. So now, again, I'm jumping through. I, I read this chart. I talked to myself a while. I thought about what could be done, couldn't have been done. But basically, this is what I told the attorney. Uh, this was a plaintiff's case. So he wanted me to say someone did something wrong. And I try very hard not to tell them what they want, but to tell them what I believe is the truth. That's not always as easy as it sounds, but I do very much try to do that. Um, I felt that in this case, given the time elements here, someone did something wrong. Uh, and here are the possible things. We will need testimony about the chain of events. Uh, the jury's going to have to hear. It's either going to be settled or the jury's going to have to hear what people have to say about who was called when and why these time, why it took so long. It's conceivable that it took so long because there, no there was no possible way of doing it faster. But this is an awfully long time from, the not from noticing a very, very bad field tracing to getting this baby delivered. Um, it's not completely clear the injury was preventable. That could be a defense, but that's not my business in this case. Um, and when talking about whether the anesthesiologist could actually have some liability, I did say that if he was told that the fetal heart rate was 80, probably the patient should have been in the OR already, but if he was told it was truly stat, nine minutes sitting in a patient's room, and that's the testimony of the patient's husband, that he sat down in a chair and filled out what looked to be a very nice preoperative evaluation, uh, was probably not within the standard of care. You could disagree, but that was, I, I don't, this case eventually got settled. I don't know how important my, my opinion was. Here's another one, uh, anesthesia delay, then we'll move to something else in, in, in a uh, community hospital. So labor epidural in place, the anesthesiologist is not in the hospital. Now there's, there could be some argument nationwide about whether this is okay. Um, certainly at big centers, we tend to think, you know, that some of the ASA guidelines imply that with the labor analgesia functioning and infusion going, and anesthesiologist should be in-house. Uh, we could actually argue that, and I was really unable to convince myself I could make that a standard of care issue, to tell you the truth. C-section is called for non-reassuring fetal heart rate. Case got started with local anesthesia because the anesthesiologist was five miles away in a hotel. Um, and uh, the anesthesiologist arrived as the baby was being delivered and converted to general anesthesia. So this woman basically had a, um, a C-section with labor analgesia. Uh, okay. Uh, she was suing for pain and suffering and post-traumatic stress disorder. Now, uh, does the anesthesiologist need to be in hospital for, with a labor epidural running? Uh, that, I'm not going to go into all the guidelines. That'd be an interesting half-hour debate with various ASA statements and how one interprets what an anesthetic versus an analgesic is. But I didn't think it was that necessary to do that. Again, to some extent, I mean, I was contacted by the plaintiff here, and I, I was uncomfortable with the care in some way. And so when I found this on the record, I thought it made the case pretty clear for me. The attestation on the anesthesia record says I was immediately available at all times. So that's either a lie or negligence, or certainly it's fraud by the usual definitions. Fraud and negligence aren't exactly the same, and my only advice to the attorney was this is going to help you if you go to try to settle this case. So again, this is not so clearly negligent as much as it is stating you're immediately available while being five miles away does not meet my standard of, of truth, if not, if not care. Now, uh, we, we're, we're going to run out of time before I get to some of the really interesting cases, probably, but there's, a, there's another principle that may help you, because this, this stuff happens almost every day. And again, you're allowed to disagree with me, but I'm going to show you a couple of cases where simply documenting little bad stuff really helps you eventually if it becomes a little worse than a little bad. I'll show you what I mean. This is a case of a patient who's alleging a post-epidural paresthesia. 
Now, we know that can happen. It's kind of a complication of the procedure. It's pretty damn rare, but it can happen. And in this case, when I first heard about it, I was saying, my goodness, how could this woman possibly sue? And there's no chance she can win. And I was consulting for the defense. This woman is complaining of a neurologic injury, basically, you know, a little pain down her right leg or left leg, whatever it was, radiculopathies. Maybe they're real, maybe they're severe um, after an epidural. But this woman had a motorcycle. She's also obese, um, quite obese, like uh, 270 pounds. But she had a motorcycle accident in the Caribbean, on some Caribbean island three years before with multiple disc bulges, physical therapy for six months or a year. Um, I don't think she had surgery, but a lot of documented disc pain issues. And now her complaints are pretty vague. And when I first looked at the chart, I said, well, this is obviously defensible. This woman had paresthesias before her epidural. So, you know, it's a pretty big risk factor for paresthesias after her epidural. But here's the clinical course. She had an epidural placed at 2 a.m., two to three attempts, moderate difficulty, decent analgesia. But it, by three hours later, she's getting multiple top-ups. Again, that can happen. The epidural's not working very well. So it's replaced, according to the nurse's note. There's no note from the anesthesiologist, not even a epidural replaced, you know, two words, which would not be adequate, but there's not even that. So the note that Dr. Jones put a new epidural in is nowhere on the chart. It was never recorded. So when the patient says, well, with that second epidural, you know, it took them two hours and he poked me a million times and he kept saying, God damn it, I, you know, I, I don't care if I'm hurting you, I'm going to keep doing this. She didn't quite say that, but she said things like that. There's no evidence whatsoever that he did it even remotely properly. Now, I thought probably we could defend this because I thought this patient, based on my reading of her history, was not going to make a great witness and the whole story looked like it probably wasn't the anesthesiologist's fault. But not having a note at all about a new epidural placement I think is not documentation within the standard of care. Whether it caused an injury, I think very unlikely, and I was willing to say that, but they settled the case for not that much money, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars I guess, but still, the problem here was pretty simple documentation. If you do a procedure that involves a big needle in someone's back, you should at least say you were there. And this is another one like it. Um, so again, if that's the only lesson you get out of this, it's not bad. Obese patient claims a nerve root injury from a labor epidural. Okay, same kind of case. The patient says that the anesthesiologist took multiple attempts that basically she said, you keep hurting me in my right hip or left hip, I don't remember which. And the anesthesiologist uh, either didn't respond or said he would try to do better or you know, but it went on uh, and she said it took forever. The anesthesia note, this is the whole note. Epidural placed L34 catheter threaded easily. Well, that, that may be what you write for your notes. We write a little bit more about the depth, the size of the needle, what level we think we're at, et cetera. But maybe you could write that note. I, I would advise you not to. But you shouldn't write that note if the nurse at the same time is writing this. The nurse clearly writing the truth. Doctor, smiley, let's say, in to see patient 1615, test dose given 57 minutes later. When you have a procedure like that, it is clearly not negligent to take 57 minutes to put an epidural in. I mean, if every one of your epidurals takes 57 minutes, you should get retrained. But I had an epidural in August. It took me an hour and 20 minutes to get the epidural in. The woman was big, but not the biggest patient I've ever had. She had about 27 needle punctures in her back. Several times I offered her that we would stop. She didn't want me to. That's not the note I wrote. The note I wrote was extremely difficult, Reason somewhat unclear, but patient obese, perhaps or you know, whatever I wrote. But I, wrote, I gave an indication that this was difficult. I acknowledged it was difficult. She didn't, that one didn't have too many paresthesias. The point is, this is not going to be an easy case to defend. If the anesthesiologist writes one, two, three, four, five, six words, implying this was kind of a five-minute procedure, and it's clear it was an hour. Again, that was settled also. Then there's bad stuff people do. I get a telephone call, I think we're driving back from my son visiting some college in Philadelphia, I think, and uh, we're in New Jersey, not a great place to be, of course, and um, this is the case. The, uh, the plaintiff's attorney calls me, he, I'd worked with him once before, and he says, I have this case, woman had a C-section, there was some acne at C-section, patient got a dose of methogen, uh, they estimated 1,200 cc blood loss, so this is, you know, a case with a little acne, a little extra blood. We've seen them, we've always seen them. Certainly patients at some extra risk for bleeding, but usually they don't, but it wasn't completely routine. Her last vitals in C-section, heart rate of 90, blood pressure 110 over 74. It's okay, maybe she's a little hypovolemic, maybe not, who the hell knows. Here's, here's they get to the recovery room like six minutes after the OR and her heart rate's 133. 
She's probably just excited to see her family. Uh, five minutes later, her heart rate's 132. Her blood pressure is 85 over 37. No doctor sees her. The obstetrician is called. He says, massage the uterus. 15 minutes later, her blood pressure is 135. Blood pressure is still hanging in there with a diastolic at 26. Not sure what that means, but it's just, we see that postpartum, don't we? Um, 15 minutes later, her heart rate's up to 140s, 84 over 22. No more uterine tonics given. No doctor there. Uh, they call the obstetrician. He says, massage the uterus. No anesthesiologist called. At 14.45, her heart rate's 151, and her blood pressure is unobtainable. I'm sure the machine's just not working. Uh, at 14.50, her heart rate's 161, blood pressure is 60 over 40. Still no doctor at bedside. Still no fluids ordered, frankly. Uh, they're still massaging the uterus. There's still blood pouring out of the vagina. 17.53, her heart rate's down a little. That's actually not a good sign. Uh, her blood pressure is essentially unobtainable. And at 15.02, they realize the IV's infiltrated. Has not been working the whole hour. Of course, they haven't tried to give any fluid either. I mean, so none's gone in, but there hasn't been any ordered. No one said give a bolus, no one said give 500, no one said give 1,000. No one, and to their credit, I guess, no one testifies that they did it either. Um, and at 15.04, she has an arrest, and that's when they figure out the IV isn't working. She doesn't do well. Um, that's not a good case. I said this is negligent. Uh, they had an hour to figure out this woman was bleeding. Even fluid at some point would have prolonged the time they had to respond. This is not appropriate medical care. It does reflect, I think, what we know about obstetric PAC use, that they're not really PAC use. We know that. That's a problem. We know it's a problem. Um, now, this is not an obstetric case. I had to show you this just so you can feel good that hopefully this would not happen at your place. But check your crash carts. Endoscopy suite, ERCP, probably the most risky procedure we do, from what I can tell. Um, propofol sedation, probably boluses. It's not really well documented. The anesthesia record is not good. Um, patient has an arrest, probably started respiratory from propofol, not completely clear, but an arrest happens. That's not good, kind of suggests negligence, but certainly doesn't prove it. Call for a crash cart, which is sort of a bad sign too, because you'd hope he'd have some of the medications in an anesthesia cart in the room, but didn't. But crash cart could be right outside. They call for a crash cart, which comes right in. It's empty. I don't mean they used the epinephrine yesterday. I don't mean they have everything except, you know, atropine. It's empty. It has never been filled. Now, what's really cool, it has a really nice logbook on top, which is signed every week for the last 51 weeks since it was bought by the nurse in the endoscopy suite saying that it's filled. Only every week. Now, I don't think it has to be checked every day. It's an endoscopy suite, for God's sake. If it had been checked once, they would have figured out it was empty. The anesthesiologist's testimony is it was still had the dust from the factory in it. So I said the second crash cart's called. This one can't be opened, and this is now death by Jayco. Uh, this is a locked cart, and no one has a key because we don't want there to be drug errors. This is the truth. I'm not making this. I love this case. I'm, it's a horrible case. The patient did not do well, but this part is pretty cool. The cart's locked. The testimony is that Joe, the anesthesia tech, who weighs about 280 pounds and was a, is a, profes was a professional wrestler or martial arts boxer, was, threw the cart to the ground and started jumping on it to try to break the lock. <laughs> but you know, it's got one of those bar locks. It doesn't open. So the third crash cart's brought. And then almost the worst part of the case is that they grab the cart, he gets epinephrine, they give it to the patient, the patient's resuscitated. But of course, not his brain. So my comment to the attorney is, why do you need me for this case? And the answer was to say what could have been done had the first cart had some drugs in it. So this is, don't let this happen. This is, you know, this is indefensible, obviously. And then I'll finish with this. Um, well, I, I'll, I have to tell you a little about this case because some of this case has been published in a series of letters in the International Journal of Obstetric Anesthesia. So 27-year-old achondroplastic dwarf. I'm sorry about the title of the slide. It's really not very nice. Um, <laughs> I, it really isn't nice. She was a very nice lady. I did meet her. She, um, she had a proper pre-op consult. The plan was to attempt an epidural for her C-section. Dwarves are generally delivered by C-section because the pelvis won't accommodate what could be a normal-sized baby. General anesthesia if you can't do an epidural. Patient arrives, spontaneous rupture of membranes, mild contractions, with no obstetrician in the hospital. Okay, well, that happens. The anesthesiologist decides to attempt to place the epidural in the labor room before the obstetrician gets there because, well, it might be difficult. At least he'll have the epidural in place. Okay. He tries a few times. Uh, achondroplasts are known to be difficult, technically. 
He gets a loss of resistance, but the catheter won't thread. I want you to think about what you think you probably should do now. No obstetrician in-house, patient with known uh, uh, difficult uh, regional anesthesia who is about, I think, three foot one, three foot three, something like that. He decides to give 3 cc 2% lidocaine with epi through the epidural needle. Um, it's not clear anything happens from that, but he gives it. It's not clear what he was trying to do, if you think about it, with that. Uh, I guess he was trying to get the catheter to thread, but you could use saline for that, probably a little safer. Um, not much happens, though. So he puts a spinal needle through the TUI. Uh, he gets no CSF, patient's stable. He does something else It's not really clear. These notes are all written later, as you will see by the next uh, note. The, the, the nurse, however, notes that the second test dose was given. Presumably that uh, 3 mLs was the first test dose. There's no note of what needle it went in, because this is the nurse's note. The doctor denies giving a second test dose. So, well, but a minute later, she has a respiratory arrest. She goes to the OR being ventilated by mask. The nurse's note in the OR says, patient ventilated, but cyanotic, dusky, and mottled. There's no blood pressure recorded for 17 minutes, although by the testimony of the anesthesiologist, the blood pressure machine was put on stat, but did not record a blood pressure. So, at, uh, 17 minutes later, 16 minutes later, epinephrine's given, she has a blood pressure, they do a C-section, baby was actually marginally okay, and the allegation basically was that the woman lost you know, 50 points on her IQ. She used to work for the State Department and now could not balance a checkbook and would not leave her house. But she wasn't dead. Um, questions for me, and this is basically, these are the kinds of things you have to look at when you're trying to see if you think there was negligence in the case. Um, was placing an epidural with no OB in the house negligent? I said putting the catheter in is of no consequence. It might even be a decent strategy. I'm not sure I would do it. But, you know, if you want to place it, you may save time. If it works, it's working and it's been in when the obstetrician gets there. You're not going to probably cause any harm by putting a piece of plastic in the patient's back. Giving a test dose to a patient who's three foot one with multiple reports in the literature of unusual response is probably not a great idea. Um, but that first test dose probably didn't cause a respiratory arrest. It might have. It's probably negligent to give it anyway. Um, did he give a second test dose? Um, I was asked, did I believe the nurse's note that said second test dose given or the doctor who said he didn't give it when there was a respiratory arrest a minute later? I believed the nurse's note. I saw no reason to believe that the nurse would suddenly come up with the idea that a second test dose was given. Um, was the treatment of the complication, the arrest, negligent? Um, I thought so. 16 minutes without a blood pressure or epinephrine in the face of a high regional is pretty much outside the standard of care, and I didn't evaluate the injury. Now, the defense expert, I know I'm a little over, but I got started late. This is worth reading. This is what the defense expert said about dosing an epidural needle uh, with local anesthetic. And again, this is what ends up in IJOA. I'll give you the reference if you're interested. I'm well aware that Lots of people give small doses of local anesthetics for two-way needles before threading catheters. It's obviously not of great consequence, although we don't recommend it in academics usually because we have residents. But this is what he said, and I, I'm not sure this is a great statement for the defense. There are people, this is about dosing through a needle. There are people, I know, friends in practice who still give a test dose through the needle. I think it is a bad idea. I don't think it's a dangerous idea, but I think it is a stupid idea. So I don't practice it myself. This was his defense of the practice. He also said, and this bothered me, especially because he was being paid twice as much as I was, he testified, and this is the real quote from his deposition, it's sitting in my office circled, he testified, I spelled evidence wrong, there was no evidence of hypotension from 1741 to 1758. The machine didn't record a blood pressure, although it was cycling stat, so there was no evidence of hypotension. That's a disingenuous statement, I, and I said so in court, and as you all know, it was a defense verdict. Plaintiff lost the case. Anesthesiologist won this case. I think it helps to be a tall white anesthesiologist in the Confederacy when you're good looking. That's, that was my opinion on the conclusion of this case. Three of the six jurors told the plaintiff's attorney that we didn't think he did it on purpose. Which, look, if you're in court, that's what you want them to think. That's how you want the jury to think, but it's not the way they're supposed to think. Every, obviously, he didn't do it on purpose. Um, it's also unclear because the plaintiff was alive whether they believed she was all that hurt. And because she was a funny looking dwarf, maybe they thought she never had been a highly functional professional um, person, which she had been. She was the daughter of one of the surgeons at the hospital too. Um, as I said, the locale seemed to be more favorable to the defense than New York or California or New Jersey or Pennsylvania. So I think I'll have to stop there because I'm over time. I can answer his questions in the panel or tell you about some other cases in the coffee break. Thanks. 